Thank you so much, choir. That's one of my favorite anthems. The unshakable kingdom of God. And we are looking forward. Amen? Are you excited for that kingdom? That's our lesson for this morning. The millennium. The unshakable kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. First, let's read our scripture reading. Would you please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20? Revelation 20. And in honor of God's word, let us all stand. Beginning at verse 1 up to verse 6. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. May God bless the reading from his holy word. Please be seated. So once again, good morning. Are we ready for God's word this morning? Now the Reverend Billy Graham, you know him, the greatest evangelist in America, tells a story about the early times of his ministry when he visited a small town for a, an evangelistic crusade. And before the crusade would start, he was looking for the post office to mail a letter. And he lost himself with the direction. So he was asking a boy, a little boy down the street, asked him for the direction. And the boy was kind enough to give him the direction. You go this way. And so he thanked the boy and said, you know what? This evening, there's going to be an evangelistic crusade in that church. If you would go there, I will tell you the way to heaven. The boy was puzzled, and the boy says, I don't think so. And Reverend Billy Graham asked, why? You don't even know the way to the post office, how much more the way to heaven? Now, friends, do you know your way to heaven? Do you know your way to heaven? We've been talking about heaven. This is the sixth part of our series. And we, we've learned that heaven is such a nice place because God is there. Amen? And that's the place where Christ went to preparing a home for you and me. But do you know your way there? It's easy for us to lose our way to important places here on earth, but if there's a place that you should never be lost finding it, it's heaven. And the only way to heaven is our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we can experience heaven because He's the way, He's the door, He's the gate, He's the narrow way that leads us to this wonderful life in heaven. And so, this is part six of our series, 
And we are going to talk about the millennium, a heaven on earth, right? Somebody asked me, why include the millennium in our study of heaven? You know why? Because the millennium, even if it's here on earth, but the description of the millennium is already equivalent to heaven. That's why it's heaven on earth. But what on earth is the millennium? Okay, honestly, how many of us here this morning don't know anything about the millennium? Raise your hand. Be honest. It's okay. All right? Some? Yes? Yes? What is the millennium? Aren't they these kids born, you know, the millennials? <laughs> Are we talking about the millennials? Well, the millennium, of course, the word millennium means a thousand years, right? Now, I want you to see this diagram. This is the personal eschatology timeline. Personal, in other words, it, it speaks of him, the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, that first portion of the prophecy was fulfilled. Christ was born. He, he came here and died for us, rose from the grave. But the second part of the prophecy is still not fulfilled. What is that part? The part where Christ will sit in the throne of David. Now, of course, where is the throne of David? It's here on earth. It's in Israel. And we visited Israel last year, amen? It's in Israel. Now, where did we find in history that Jesus Christ already sat at the throne of David and started a kingdom that will never end? Well, we say, well, there is already the kingdom in our hearts, right? It's true. When we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, He becomes our King and we become part of His, what? Spiritual kingdom. But we are not just talking here of a spiritual kingdom. We are also talking here of a real kingdom upon which Jesus will sit in the throne of David as King of kings and Lord of lords. And if you go back to the prophecies in the scripture, you have so many prophecies in almost book of prophecies. You find there that the God's people is looking forward to their Messiah to be seated at the throne in, in Jerusalem, not in heaven. So that's why we need to study this millennial reign of Jesus Christ, right? So the first thing that we are going to study is the passage of the millennium, the passage, okay? We need to study the passage, where it all starts. What does the book of Revelation tell us about this millennium? All right, the first thing we find in Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse 1 to 4, is this, the, remo the removal of Satan, okay? The removal of Satan from the earth, okay? Look at verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. Notice this, out of heaven. So technically, the vision that John is seeing here is not, in heaven, because the angel is coming out from heaven, all right? Having the keys of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So that's where we get the idea. So, the angel took Satan, bound him with chains, and threw him into the abyss, or what we call the bottomless pit. You know what is the bottomless pit in the book of Revelation? It is the place where fallen angels are being incarcerated. They are in prison, right? Some of these bad angels will be let loose during the tribulation, right? But this abyss or bottomless pit is basically a prison cell for bad angels. <laughs> As you may know, not, not all demons are going around. Some of them are so bad that they have to be in prison. 
But one day, during the tribulation, all right, these bad angels will be released. All right? And, and, you know, create havoc here on earth. All right? That's terrible, right? So, so Satan will be bound there for a thousand years. He threw him into the beast and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until, take note, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Now, by the way, the word there, thousand years is being repeated for six times. So much if it's just, you know, a minor thing. It's being repeated in this chapter for six times. All right, the second thing we find from the passage, the resurrection of the saints on earth, right? Not, not only, so when you say the millennium, during the millennium, it's a thousand years, take note, no Satan, no demons in the earth. Imagine that, a, an earth that we live in minus demons. Of course, if the, if the king of the demons is incarcerated, of course, all the others as well. So the resurrection of the saints on earth. Look at this, verse 4. I saw thrones in which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And you know, remember, Paul tells us that we are also going to judge angels, right? In, in 1 Corinthians, I think it's in chapter 5 or chapter 6. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the Word of God. So these are the believers, the martyrs, right? So John saw their souls. What happened to these souls? They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and on their hands. Take note, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, so that's what will happen in the millennium. Christ will come, bound Satan, you know, for a thousand years, so no Satan in the world, and then the believers will be resurrected. The rest of the dead, meaning to say the unbelievers, did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection will be the resurrection of the believers. The other resurrection will happen after the millennium. This is the resurrection for the unbelievers because they are going to face the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. Now, the Bible says, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. What is the second death? Those who will be thrown into the lake of fire. So in other words, those who, are, who take part in the first resurrection, they will not be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. All right? The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now, the third thing about the millennium is this, the reign of Savior and the saints on earth. That's the third, you know, highlight of the millennium. Christ will reign on earth, will sit in the throne of David as promised, as prophesied in the Old Testament, that he is going to sit in the throne of David. And together with Christ, the saints, the believers who died, who are now resurrected, will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Notice this. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It is repeated in verse 6. And will reign with Him for a thousand years. Right? So, imagine a world in which only believers will rule, you know? Imagine a world where the president is a Christian, the senators are Christians, the barangay, all officials, from the president down to the on say, pinaka lowest levels of barangay, barangay tanod, they are all believers. So imagine a world without corruption. 
That's the millennium. That's why we call it the heaven that is on earth. All right? That's the millennium. All right? So having known the passage, now we are going to study the perspectives of the millennium because, brethren, there is no other topic in the Bible that is more controversial and that has divided the church history than this topic about the millennium. Right? So I want us to know what church history, you know, teach and what we have been holding on as the meaning of this millennium. You know, we just read what happened there, but the next question is, how do Christians in, throughout history understand Revelations 20, 1 to 6? <laughs> because as if we, we think that we are united, no, no. There have been three major views about the millennium, right? So let me start with the first one, okay? Now, let me give you the general eschatology timeline, okay? We have to understand first the timeline of eschatology. You know what is eschatology, by the way? Eschatology, okay? It's the study that makes you katul, eschatul. You know, mangatul juga. Eschatos means end times, right? So it's a study of end times or the last days, right? Eschatology. General eschatology is this. You have, the, you have Christ, the cross there, that's Jesus Christ. And then the church age, that's us now. Like this is known as the church age. Now, the next phase in, in eschatology is what you call the great tribulation. Now, we do not know. There's a bar there, but we are not sure, okay? Some... Some believers say we are not yet there because we are not yet raptured. Okay? That's just a view. Others are saying we don't know. Maybe we are already in the tribulation. Maybe this pandemic is part of the tribulation. It depends on your view. But that's the next phase. Then the next phase is the millennium, the thousand years. Again, some things it's a real 1,000 years. Others are saying maybe we are in the millennium. It depends on your view. And then you have the eternal state, the new heaven, and the new earth. All right? So at least we understand. Now, where are we now? We are in the church age. That's where we are in the timeline. So we know that the next phase in the timeline is the great tribulation. Okay? Now, let's start with the first view. Amillennialism. All right? When you add a, a word, a, uh, to a word, it negates it. It means no. So this is the belief that there is no literal millennium, but that the millennium is symbolic of a present reality realized through Christ's reign in heaven and within the hearts of believers. So the amil or amillennialism, this is the view, okay, this is what they believe that the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20 is just symbolic of the whole church age until Christ will come. So this is their diagram. Very simple. After Christ ascended, that's the beginning of the millennium. Until the great tribulation. So the next thing that the church will be expecting is simply all the eschatological things like the second coming, the resurrection, judgment day, and then you have a new earth. Now what's good with this email? It's very simple. <laughs> Not complicated. What's the next thing we are waiting? The second coming of Christ. That's all. So from the time Jesus ascended up to the second coming of Christ, everything there, that's just the symbolic millennium. It's, it's not literal 1,000 years. In fact, since Christ ascended up to now, it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> it's been 2,000 years. Okay? So for them, they say that Satan is bound now. Right? They're saying, that's what the Emil believes, that the church now can successfully bring the gospel to nations because Satan has been bound. And they say, when was Satan bound? Well, they say, when Christ rose from the grave, Satan was bound at that time. So that's how they interpret Revelations 20. 
All right? Do you agree with them? I don't think so. <laughs> so definitely Bradford is not a mill, huh? All right. The second view, post-millennialism. This is what is known as the optimistic view. The, the belief that the church ushers in the millennium. They believe that we are now in the church age, but then it is the church that would usher in the millennium, this golden age in which Christian ethics prosper through the triumph of the gospel, and then Christ will come. So what is the diagram of the post mill? We are now in the church age, but then through our ministry, through our missions, if the church will really work hard in fulfilling the Great Commission, you know what will happen? We will be able to Christianize the world. When Christians run for office, so do you have a Christian president, you have Christian senators, you have Christian all officials, then what will happen is that the world will become a better place. We fulfill the Great Commission, we bring in the kingdom of God. Now, for many years, this has been the view of so many Christians because this is the optimistic view. In fact, a lot of missionaries and mission groups, their belief is post-millennialism. That we need to bring the gospel to people because when we bring the gospel to people, it will change the world. At the time when revivals were happening in the world, they thought that that was it post-millennial, that Christ will come because the church prepares the world for him to sit down. But soon we realize that the world is not getting better, <laughs> all right? As knowledge progress, you know, what happened? The morality of people were getting low. So in other words, it's not what we are thinking. Yes, it's true. We brought the gospel to the world, so many Christians. Half of the world today are Christians, but it's not making the world a Christ-like kingdom. In fact, right now, a lot of people are rejecting Christ. So definitely we can say maybe post-millennialism is not the right view. All right? Then there's the third, and I'm sure maybe we belong to this group. The pre-millennialism, pre mill Okay, what is the pre-mill? The pre-mill is sim simple. It takes Revelations 20, 1 to 6 at its face value. We take it as it is. The belief that after the second coming of Christ, He will set up His kingdom on earth and reign for a literal 1,000 years. That's the view. It's, it's called pre-mill. It means that Christ will come before the millennium. Post mill because Christ will come after the millennium. Okay? So, in the pre mill view, in the pre mill perspective, there are actually two distinct types. All right? Let me take first the classic or historical. When you say classic or historical, it means that this has been the view for most of, the, of church history. All right? That's why it's called classic or historical. Now, what is the classic or the historical pre mill? There's the church age, that's now. And then comes the great tribulation. All right? Now, here's the difference. In the classic or historical pre mill the church will go through the great tribulation. Then Christ will come after the great tribulation. There's the second coming, and the rapture of the church is going to be the same thing. He will resurrect believers, and then together reign with Christ in the whole world for a thousand years. All right? And then right after the thousand years, Satan will be released, and again, he would rage and, and deceive the nations, and then there's going to be a great battle. They would want to, to wage war with Christ, but then Christ subdues them. Then you have the great white throne judgment. Satan will be cast to the lake of fire, and then all the dead that were not part of, of the millennium, they will be raised to life so that they would face the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment. 
And all those names not written in the book of life were cast down to the lake of fire. But to those believers, we enter the new heaven and new earth. All right? So that's the classical or historical pre-mill. The other one is what you call dispensational pre-mill. And I would assume this is where most of us okay, belong. All right? What is the dispensational? That we are now in the church age. All right? But before the rapture will take place, I mean before the great tribulation will take place, the church will be raptured. All right? So in the, in the dispensational pre-mill, Christ's coming is not just before the millennium, but He will take the church before the tribulation. That's why you have a pre-trib, pre-mill. All right? Before the rapture, I mean before the tribulation, Christ will rapture the church. He will take the church, bring us to heaven, and then there's going to be chaos, there's going to be calamities, there's going to be bad things happening in the earth to test the earth, and then Christ will come after the seven-year great tribulation together with the saints and angels, reign on the earth for a thousand years, and then after the thousand years is ended, enter into the new heaven and new earth. All right? So that's the dispensational pre-meal, right? If you ask me now, Pastor, where do you, <laughs> you know, where, which perspective do you hold on to? Of course, obviously, I am a pre-meal, all right? A pre-meal. As to whether dispensational or historical, secret. <laughs> all right. Sige, dispensational, ingon si nanay. All right. Now, friends, you have to understand, these are just views. All right? We should not be so dogmatic about this because even theologians and pastors, even up to now, a lot of email are becoming pre-mail and some pre-mail are becoming email. I mean, all these things, we do not know. All right? So I don't want to stand here and tell you, you know, that, you know, we should be dogmatic because after all, when Christ says, and then the reality is that it's email, then we, oh, sorry, I, you know, I made a mistake. I don't want to do that, all right? If, if Christians all throughout the history even cannot, <laughs> cannot decide which one, why should we? <laughs> In other words, just choose where you think, you know? As you study the Scripture, we all have the same Holy Spirit. How, how is it possible that it is a pre-mail, an email, or a post-mail? It depends. That important thing is that Christ will come. Amen? Amen? Now, the difference between Emil and, and Primil is this. The reign of Christ for the Emil is in heaven. So they still have the, the, all the prophecies about Christ's reign, but they're saying it happens in heaven. So for them, the millennial reign of Christ is the intermediate state not here on earth. But for us, pre-mill, we believe that the prophecies concerning Christ's reign here on earth is where? Here on earth. All right? Now, that brings us to the third, no? The portrait of the millennium. Why would we say that the millennium is here on earth? Okay? Why? Because of what the prophets are telling us. All right? Now, we need to understand that even though the topic about the millennium, a lot of people are saying, how could you make such a big theology in six verses in Revelation 20? You know why? Yes, it's just six verses there, but the whole chunk of, of prophecies in the Old Testament are talking about it. <laughs> All right? In other words, friends, there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament that, that it, it puzzles scholars as to where to put it. Because the description is so heavenly and yet there is still the presence of sin and corruption. So how can you put a, a, a prophetic age in which it's, there's peace, it's like heaven, but then there are people can still die? There are still enemies? Where could you put that? You cannot put that in the eternal state. You cannot also put that in the intermediate state because there's no evil in heaven. The only way is to have what? That maybe 
this, this golden age that the prophets are talking about, maybe it's going to happen here on earth. All right? Like, for example, Zechariah 14. There are so many verses. And by the way, we are just giving you some of them. So many. We can have the whole year talk about the millennium. Don't worry. All right. The Lord will be king over the whole world or the whole earth. See? That's Zechariah 14. On that day, it's talking about that day. There will be one Lord and His name, the only name, the whole land from, from Jeba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, will become like Araba. But Jerusalem will be raised up high from the Benjamin Gate to the site of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the royal wine presses and will remain in its place. So the idea here is that Jerusalem will be raised up. We do not know how. Some, some scholars would say maybe Jerusalem will be floating on that day. We do not know, but we always see movies like that. All right? Maybe that's how God will fulfill it. It will be inhabited. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will, not, will rot while they are still standing on their feet. This is fulfilled in, in Revelation 19 at the second coming of Christ. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Can you imagine that? The plague, it's instantaneous. The moment you have that disease, it simply rots. That's how the Bible describes it. On that day, people will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. They will seize each other by the hand and attack one another. You see the havoc going on here? This happens at the second coming of Christ for the unbelievers. Judah too will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding nation will be collected. Great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. So we now know the resources we need in rebuilding you know, the earth because it, it will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. A similar plague will strike the horses and mules, the camels and donkeys, and all animals in those camps, meaning the enemy camps. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up. Take note. Year after year to worship the king. So there will be survivors at the second coming. These are the people who will repopulate the earth for the thousand years. The survivors. Only those unbelievers will be you know, cast out to the lake of fire on the second coming of Christ. Some people on the earth will believe in Jesus as he comes. So, dito sa maapil sa impirno. They will be brought to the kingdom of God. Morning, ipasabot dere, no? The Lord Almighty to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. If any of the people of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. Now, that's a question. This is not definitely heaven. <laughs> but this is also not eternal state because there are no enemies in the eternal state. Right? So how come you have here the reign of Christ but then people are what? Are encouraged, are commanded to come and worship the king in Jerusalem. If they don't come, okay. Philippines, if you don't come, no rain. <laughs> Where do you put that in in? In, in the eschatological timeline. See, it's not in heaven, definitely. So there's, it's happening here on earth. So that's the millennial reign of Christ. Christ will, will rule all the survivors from the great tribulation. Those who will believe in Christ, they will repopulate the earth. So Jesus will reorganize the earth. And remember in the parable of, ten, of Minas, those who are faithful, remember Jesus says, because you are faithful with five, you will, ra you will rule five cities. So, Nanai, you will be the queen of Cebu. Oh, diba? 
Oh. Ana. Katong way gibuhat sa ministry wa. Okay, ikaw mo oy barangay tanod. <laughs> the believers will reign with Christ. That's the idea. All right? Christians will be reigning with Christ. Of course, the earth will be repopulated. Jesus Christ will restructure back the earth. So he needs people to serve the whole world because he's going to reign as king. Okay? So what are the things that we can expect in the millennium? Number one, it will be a time of peace. Okay? So what we read in Zechariah, that's the second coming. Jesus will set up his kingdom here on earth. It will be a time of peace. Look at Micah 4, 2-4. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So, in the millennium, friends, you know, the center of the world is Jerusalem. That's where Christ will be seated because that's the promise. He will sit in the throne of David. And of us, kitang mga Christians, I would say, no, I would believe, uh, because nations will still be there. For us Christians who are Filipinos, of course, we will still remain in the Philippines. But we are His, what? Officials. So we will be going back and forth. Philippines, so pariporton ta, Pastor Maki, pariporton ka ni Jesus, mariporta dito. That's what will happen here. Right? Nations will report to Christ and, 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 and worship Him. That's the idea. Right? To the temple of the God of Jacob, He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths, the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So God's law will be the one used in all nations. All right? He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes. So see, there will still be disputes at the time. Definitely, this is not in heaven. No disputes in heaven. All right? There will still be disputes. For strong nations far and wide, they will beat their swords into, take note, plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. And by the way, that phrase is used in, in a statue okay, across the building of the United Nations in the state. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's basically the theme of the United Nations. Their goal is simple supposedly for peace. But friends, United Nations would never accomplish it. Only Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, only Christ can fulfill this. All right? Nations, take note, will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. See? So for this thousand years, no more war. Everyone will sit under their own vine, under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. It's a golden age. You don't have to fear. So this, during this time, we don't need mga, mga security guards. We don't need mga locking system. During this time, wala yung mga what? <laughs> it's going to be a peaceful. All the lands are at rest. And at peace, they break into singing. See? It's a peaceful earth. Second, it will be a time of prosperity. Okay, not just peace. It's a time of prosperity. Notice this, Ezekiel 34, 26-27. I will make them the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season and there will be showers of what? of blessings. See? The trees will yield their fruit. The ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. No, no fear. You will not be threatened. Why mga what? They will know that I am the Lord. And when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them, the days are coming, according to Amos 9, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. You know, do you understand that? It's so fast na wala pagali siya na human na nay nanurok. Okay? Nag, nag-abot na ba? Ang reaper o ang harvester or ang, ang planter. Nag-abot nga naman because during this time, there's abundance in the land. 
the usual six months to wait is it will not be six months. See? Monegi pasabot. So so Amos is looking forward to the time nga the waiting of six months no longer applies. Alright? In other words, new wines will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. The seed will grow well, the vine will yield its fruit, the ground will produce its crops, and the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. You see? It's going to be a time of prosperity. So we were thinking, uh, these things can happen in heaven. Well, this can happen on earth during the millennial reign of Christ. Third, it will be a time of purity. No evil. Evil will be banished by our Lord during this time. Look at Zechariah 13 verse 2. I will erase idol worship throughout the land so that even the names of the idols will be forgotten. I will remove from the land both false prophets and take note, the spirit of impurity that came with them. See? So during the millennial reign of Christ, friends, it's going to be a pure, you know, a pure society without the presence of evil. Okay? It's going to be a perfect earth. That's the millennial reign. Number four, it will be a time of prolonged life. No need of, you know, no cancer during this time. Okay? Christ will provide us the cure for cancer. No pandemic during this time. Notice this, Isaiah 60, 65 verse 20. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. So, nai, wal nagi kuyaw ani ka ng mga matay, nga mga stillborn, no? Or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought, will be thought a mere child. Imagine, kung mamatay ko no kag 100, mura na kag bata. <laughs> so this is not yet heaven. Nga naman, the fact that people will still die. So this is not in heaven. This is not in new heaven and new earth. So where is this? This is here on earth. See? The one who fails to reach 100 will be considered what? A curse. See? So nagya po yung presence of sin. In other words, during this time, kung dali kang mamatay, nakasa ka. Nga naman, because the, the word nga for the wages of sin is death will be so real at this time. <laughs> so muna, ang mga tawa ni mag-careful yun, di, di ko, makasakay, mamatay ko, kalit na rin. <laughs> because that's what the Bible says. See? Because if you sim- simply follow and obey the Lord, the Bible says, you will live long lives. Alright? And number five, it will be a time of praise. Right? No mourning, no sorrow. Sometimes we think that those times, nga no more mourning, no sorrows, it happens in new heaven, new earth. It can happen here again when Christ is reigning over us. Notice Isaiah 9, 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You see? Isaiah 14, 7, The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. So all joyful things, happy things during the millennium. Right? Now there we have friends. There's so many things in the scripture. Again, you're excited, right? Are you excited? But you might ask, why is there a millennium? Well, this is a foretaste again of heaven. Why is there a millennium? Because Jesus Christ wants to fulfill as He has promised that He's coming soon to set up His kingdom. Alright? One thing about the millennium that we can learn is this. If sin is not yet eliminated in the world, there is still a possibility of rebellion. You know why? Because after the, re- the millennium, Satan will be released. And notice this, he can still gather a multitude of rebels. That means, okay, that tells us that unless God will eliminate sin, sin will always, you know, produce 
more sinners. That's the lesson about the millennium. It's a lesson that Christ has to deal with sin. You know? Ultimately, where? At the judgment day. Okay? But before that, people need to acknowledge Him. Let me close with Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Okay? It says there that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and even those under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is talking about the second coming of Christ. Right? Friends, we are gathered here this morning because we have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. But there are other people out there in the world. It's so sad that on Judgment Day, they will have to be forced to bow down to Him. But for us today, if we freely bow down to Christ as our Lord and Savior, then on that day, we will reign with Him. If you want others to reign with Christ, then tell others to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you praise. We give you thanks. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are our King. You are our Lord. We look forward to your second coming, Lord Jesus. We are so excited. And so please come. Come and reign with us. Come and change our world. Lord, this gives us a picture, oh God, as a backdrop, Lord, amidst all the chaos, corruption of our government, of our, of our nation, of the world today, real solution does not come from people. It comes from you, Jesus. May we trust you, Lord, so that you can reign over us in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.